Hey everyone, welcome to This Is Automation. My name is Corey Dallas. By day, I'm a sales engineer for BNR Industrial Automation, and by night, I'm the host of This Is Automation. This podcast is designed for experienced engineers, executives, students, and pretty much anybody in between that has an interest in automation. We're going to be covering a wide variety of topics in industrial automation, robotics, IIoT, and machinery, ranging from really deep dive technology discussions like CNC path planning, all the way to higher level strategic discussions, for example, about implementation of IIoT and cybersecurity. We're going to be talking to industry experts on those really deep dive technology discussions to get some interesting perspective there. And then on the other side, we'll also be talking to some really successful business leaders from around the world to get their perspective on how to implement automation and how to take advantage of some of the new technology that's coming out. So I'm very excited to get started with this podcast, and I'm really looking forward to getting to interact with you guys. So let's go ahead and kick this first episode off where we're going to be talking all about the PLC. Well, it is a brand new year, 2019, and hopefully everybody had really good New Year's Eve parties. They stayed up drinking some champagne, hanging out with friends. Um, hopefully, though, none of you guys had a hangover, which I'm sure that you didn't. But on New Year's Day in 1968, a man named Dick Morley had a New Year's Day hangover. The unfortunate part of that is that Mr. Morley uh, was late on a relay automation project for his firm Bedford and Associates. So Dick was uh, in a little bit of a challenging situation. I'm sure we've all been there before, overindulged the night before, and then had some work to do the next day. So it's really, really interesting what Dick ended up doing here, though. So basically, he'd been facing some challenges with the flexibility and modularity of, of the microcomputer and relay solutions that were pretty typical of that time in the, in the early, uh, mid and late 60s uh, for automation projects. And, you know, I think it was maybe a little bit of hangover magic and a little bit of his uh, growing frustration with, with the uh, complexity of the projects. Uh, Dick Morley on that New Year's Day uh, basically decided that he was going to solve the problem um, instead of just designing another relay system. So on that day, uh, Dick Morley basically on the back of a napkin uh, created the PLC. Now, of course, he didn't uh, you know, do any of the electrical design or anything like that, but he laid out uh, more or less what would be the specification to define what the PLC would be. So, you know, a modular system, uh, that can be used to control an automation system. You know, just just to quickly summarize it, there's obviously a lot more to it than that. So Dick Morley uh, and his uh, colleagues ended up developing multiple prototypes based on his New Year's Day hangover-induced idea, uh, but eventually they released what was called the Modicon, which stands for Modular Digital Controller 84, uh, to the market uh, to meet the needs of a certain large automotive manufacturer that you may have heard of. So... You know, we, we kind of give Dick Morley the credit uh, for, for coming up with the idea of the PLC on New Year's Day in 1968. Um, but actually, there was a engineer from the GM Hydromatic Division, uh, which they, they made transmissions at the time. And the engineer from GM uh, released a white paper outlining some problems that they were having at the plant, uh, which ended up being very similar to the the pains that I mentioned that Dick Morley was having uh, as far as challenging uh, flexibility and modularity and, and things like this uh, with the, the traditional relay uh, automation systems. So eventually, uh, based on the white paper, GM presented a specification uh, for, for this standard machine controller is what they called it, but it would eventually become uh, known as the PLC. So the specification that GM came out with uh, included some requirements uh, based on environmental robustness, modularity of the system was really important, uh, the number of inputs and outputs that could be supported, the amount of memory that the system needed, and many, many others. 
Uh, so basically, you know, when we say those things, it's very much what we're familiar with when we're looking at a PLC today. It's going to be environmentally robust. It's got to be modular. Uh, the numbers of inputs and outputs of, is, of course, important and scalable. Uh, memory is important, so on and so forth. So really, the the specification that GM laid out uh, back in the late 60s is really still true today. So the finalized specification eventually was provided to a variety of different vendors. Uh, so of those that received that specification, only three actually delivered uh, something to GM. So the first of those was DEC, which is the Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, they delivered the PDP-14. Uh, so DEC, you, I'm sure you haven't heard of them. Maybe you have. Uh, but basically, they were later acquired by Compaq, which then eventually merged with HP in 2002. So they were more on the consumer side of things. And this was kind of their... Uh, they were trying to get into the industrial side, but it, it never really went anywhere. So the second firm that, that submitted something was 3i. Uh, they submitted what they called the PDQ2. Uh, that product and uh, 3i itself would eventually be acquired by Alan Bradley. And then the last one, we have to come back to our good old friend, Dick Morley and his firm, Bedford & Associates. Uh, so they actually took the concepts that Dick Morley had come up with and applied them to the GM specification and submitted a product as well. So they they actually were the ones that ended up winning the contract with GM with the Modicon 84 controller. After Bedford and Associates won that contract with GM, it's not like everybody just gave up and they were like, all right, uh, you know, these guys at Bedford and Associates are, are the only standard machine controller or PLC out there. So we're just going to give up and you guys have fun taking 100% market share. Of course not. Uh, so, you know, 3i continued to innovate on their product. And then, you know, when Alan Bradley acquired them, they continued to innovate. Um, and then also some new players came into the game as well. You, you'd see Siemens come in pretty early. BNR would come in in the late 70s, uh, so on and so forth. And what we end up with uh, now today is a really, really diverse market for PLCs and automation technology. I'm sure there's still some of you out there thinking, all right, this is cool. Uh, some some dude that I don't know was hung over and made up this thing, the PLC, and then GM was involved somehow. But what is a PLC, right? So I'm sure some of you are thinking that. Some of you, uh, this is going to be just review as far as what a PLC actually does. So we're going to dive right into that as soon as we get back from the short break. Before the break, we talked about where the PLC comes from and a little bit about its history and origins. But again, there may still be some of you out there that don't even know what a PLC is. So I want to make sure that we can get into a little bit of the technical details. Um, some of it's going to be higher level and then a little bit of it will be uh, more in depth. So to, to just kind of kick us off, a PLC um, is obviously an acronym. So the first thing that we need to do to kind of unpack what a PLC is, is understand what the acronym means. Uh, so PLC stands for Programmable Logic Controller. Um, we'll dive into that a little bit more detail as we go on. Uh, but basically what that means is that the PLC is a ruggedized computer. Um, and, and that computer operates in real time, which again, we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and, and its function is to control processes or uh, any other sort of system in machinery and in factories. That's typically where you see a PLC used. So what a PLC does is it essentially takes inputs uh, from, you know, it could be sensors, it could be a user input of some sort. Uh, then it performs some sort of calculations internally, and then it sends outputs to different actuators or to even to other machines or other systems uh, that may be, for example, in the cloud uh, to perform some sort of process, right? So the PLC at its core is controlling a machine. Uh, so again, to do that, it's taking sensors, uh, you know, or user inputs, uh, doing some sort of manipulation to those um, with, you know, perhaps some internal variables and then outputting to actuators on the machine. So an actuator is, is essentially just a component of the machine that's used to either move or control some mechanism or some system. So when, when we say actuator, uh, it's not only things like a pneumatic actuator, but you can also think electric motor, hydraulic cylinder, solenoids, etc. So anything that takes an output from the PLC, we'll, we'll just generically call that an actuator. And then when I say sensor, uh, that's basically a device that detects events or changes in the machine environment. So when I say sensor, you can think of things like thermocouples, pressure transducers, etc. And then when we talk about user input, 
Uh, oftentimes that's gonna come through an HMI, which stands for human machine interface. So that's the interface through which humans interact with the machine. Uh, that's typically gonna be a touch screen uh, that's gonna have you know multiple pages with different buttons and things like that, something that you'd be familiar with, uh, for example, on your personal computer, but just at the machine level. The other type of user input is actually physical inputs uh, that are wired you know, either into the IO of the PLC or are communicating on some field bus. So that would be uh, something like a switch. It could be a key switch, uh, a multi-position switch. It could be a, a push button, uh, any sort of uh, user input. So to kind of recap that and talk about it in terms of, uh, you know, real sensors, real actuators, and a real PLC function, uh, let's talk about a really simple PLC application. Now, just as kind of a disclaimer, you would actually not use a PLC for something like this uh, because the PLC in this example is going to do virtually nothing except for pass the input to the output. Uh, but again, I think it'd be really good for the sake of having a simple example. So using our uh, kind of architecture of a sensor or user input PLC operation and then an actuator on the machine. For our input, we're gonna use a switch. And in this case, it would be a light switch. Uh, so that's a, a switch that has two positions, uh, an on and an off. Okay, and those would be represented into the PLC as a digital signal. So just a binary signal that is either a one for on or a zero for off. Now on the actuator side, we're gonna have a lamp or a light. So for example, we'll just say an LED. Uh, so that LED is also a digital, um, it's gonna be taking in a digital signal. So it's either gonna be a, a one uh, to power on the LED or a zero to power off the LED. And then in the middle is where we're gonna handle the logic that controls how that input, the light switch is tied to that output, uh, the light itself. So in this case, all the PLC is doing is linking the input of the switch to the output of the LED itself. So for example, we turn the switch uh, on. So the PLC sees a one for the digital input. Then the PLC is, you know, through the logic that we've coded, going to pass that one into the output register for the digital output, which is then going to be sent electrically to the LED and the light will turn on. So I mentioned that you would never use a PLC for this. And the reason is, again, that the PLC is not really doing anything. You could just directly tie the switch and the light together, which is what is happening anytime that you have a light switch. Uh, but the beauty of the PLC is that you could do anything in between using that same input and same output. Another really simple example would be if we turn that input on, that light switch on, in our PLC, we could have a timer, for example, a five second timer. So when the PLC sees that input come on, it will actually wait five seconds before setting the output register to true. So you would turn your light switch on and then five seconds later, the LED would illuminate. So since we're talking about timing and connecting inputs and outputs, this is a really good time to talk about what real time means or determinism. So in a automation system, whenever we have a system that we're controlling, we need the outputs to occur and the calculations to occur within a discrete time window relative to the event that's happening in that machine. And this is really, really important to make sure that we're acting on the events around our machine within a sufficient time so that the process can A, be executed properly. So for example, in the case of tight motion synchronization, we need to make sure that when we send that signal to our motion control system, that it's actually moving the actuator when we expect it to. So that's, again, really important to make sure that the process happens properly. So this is important for, for making sure that whatever product or, or whatever's happening on the machine is actually being done correctly so that it's not, you know, every, every one out of 100 widgets that we make on our machine is actually good. And then the other 99 we have to throw away because we push the button on the HMI and then it may or may not happen within the time frame that we're expecting it to. So you can see why it's important on, on that side. The other side of it is for safety, right? So again, we need to know that when we have an input going to our machine, whether that's through the HMI or some sensor, that our machine is going to react within an appropriate amount of time so that it is predictable and easy to control. Now, determinism is a fairly complicated topic, so it honestly deserves its own episode to really get into the nuances uh, and, and to make sure that you fully understand what's happening with it. But for now, we'll just kind of leave that alone. 
and just understand that it is important for a PLC to have determinism so that we can control the processes on our machine efficiently and safely. So the next thing that's really important to understand about a PLC is how you actually program it. Uh, so we kind of have a good idea of uh, what a PLC does as far as taking in inputs, doing some sort of calculation, and then spitting out outputs. But how do you actually define what the calculations or whatever is happening inside the PLC? So typically this happens using some sort of application software or IDE on a standard PC. Uh, the software is typically going to come from a PLC manufacturer, but in some cases this may be an open source IDE or some sort of uh, semi-modified open source IDE. The languages that you're gonna typically program in for a PLC and a standard application are gonna to conform to IEC 61131-3, which is a standard that defines the programming languages that are acceptable to use in control systems. So there's five of them. Uh, they are function block diagram, ladder diagram, structured text, instruction list, and sequential function chart. Uh, honestly, the only two that you're probably ever going to encounter in the average machine are ladder diagram, also known as the ladder logic, or structured text. The most common by far still is probably ladder diagram or ladder logic, uh, but there's a clear shift in the industry happening right now towards more of the text-based languages like structured text, and some machines are even being coded in C and C++, for example, which are kind of outside of the IEC 61131-3 standard. Uh, and the reason that's happening is basically machine control is expanding in complexity and scope. Uh, so not only is it kind of the basic control that, that has been happening for you know, 30, 40, 50 years, there's a lot of new things happening, really complicated motion control with really uh, you know, tight cycle times and tight synchronization. Uh, really complicated vision applications uh, with, you know, uh, object identification. And, and there's lots of complicated things with vision that we can talk about later. And, you know, lots of other applications that are kind of complicated with communication requirements like IIoT and things like that, where you want to communicate up to the cloud. If you're trying to stick with ladder, some of those things are going to be kind of hard to implement. When you move to a text-based languages, it really opens up the opportunities for you. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a use case for a ladder diagram. There definitely is. Ladder diagram was originally designed to replicate the old school relay logic. So it's really easy for uh, service technicians and end users that are actually using machine to understand what's going on in the code. It's really easy to diagnose. Uh, but again, you kind of have some of those downsides where you're limited in the scope of complexity that your application can have. So if you try to implement a really complicated program in ladder, it's going to get unusable really, really quick, but it's still a very, very good language for a simple application. Anything that's just handling inputs and outputs using some of the standard PLC functions like timers and counters, uh, any sort of alarm handling is really, really good for ladder because again, it's really easy for people to understand. Most of the service technicians already out in the field understand how to diagnose this. So that, that's why I say that alarm handling is, is often a good uh, task to be written in ladder diagram. Uh, but again, you're just going to want to look at this kind of as a case-by-case -case basis as far as which language is going to be right for your application. So what happens after you've written the code kind of depends on which uh, architecture you're living in. Uh, so for example, in the BNR world, we use compiled code, uh, but I know a lot of you out there are probably going to be using an Allen Bradley system, and they're running interpreted code. So there's a pretty stark difference between those, and I'll try to come off uh, as unbiased as I can, but just bear in mind that uh, the company that I work for and believe in is using compiled code, so I, I think there's some benefits there. So we'll start with compiled code. Um, basically, with compiled code, the code is compiled into a machine-readable language on the PC. So you write your code in the uh, development environment, and then you push a button that compiles the code. So that takes all of the human readable code that you've written and transfers it into something that ma the machine can actually understand. Then you transfer that machine code onto the PLC. So the advantages of this are it's gonna run faster on the PLC and also all of your PLC resources are gonna be used for actually running the code instead of interpreting it at runtime constantly. The other upside to compiled code is that it's really easy to protect your IP uh, when I say IP, I mean intellectual property when you're using compiled code because the source code is typically not stored on the PLC. So that's something that 
the machine builder or the person that programmed the machine would have access to. But then once it gets transferred onto the PLC, it's pretty much locked down and there's no way to uh, take it back from, you know, the machine code into um, a human readable code without an excessive amount of work. And if you're going to do that, you, you might as well just rewrite the code. So it's a really, really safe um, method and it's really good at securing your IP, which is becoming more and more important as um, OEMs are implementing really complicated and really, uh, really kind of groundbreaking and market differentiating technologies into their PLCs. So typically there is an option to include an encrypted copy of the source code if you want to do that. Um, it's usually just a checkbox and then you can transfer it either password protected or not. Uh, and people would do that if they wanted to give, for example, the end user or service technicians access to their code. But again, uh, in my experience, I've been seeing uh, more and more people that are building and designing automation systems. They don't want that source code to get into the hands of the end user anymore uh, because of the level of complexity that it's reaching. So the other side of that is interpreted code. So interpreted code is basically transferred to the PLC and then interpreted at runtime. So there's no compiling happening on your personal uh, laptop or desktop. All of that human readable code that you've written is being interpreted in real time on the PLC. And this sounds really cool and it is really cool. Uh, and it also means that changes to the code can happen on the fly without the need to recompile, which is one of the downsides of compiled code is that anytime you make a change to the code, you're gonna have to recompile it. So interpreted code can be better for uh, A, debugging, and then B, changing code at runtime. It's just gonna be simpler uh, because of the nature of it. However, interpreted code, as I mentioned, runs slower, which means that it may not be the right choice for applications that require really fast cycle times or really tight synchronization of any type. Uh, it also means that your source code is more or less generally exposed uh, and the possibility for man manipulation of your IP is higher. Now, again, it is the modern era and most companies have ways to safeguard against this, but it's just something to uh, be aware of. You're going to have to have some additional safeguards around that structure, whereas compiled code is inherently more secure. So the last thing that we need to talk about related to PLCs and programming them is scan time, or what you may also hear referred to as cycle time. So this is essentially the time at which the tasks in your PLC are being executed. So PLCs are typically executing their code cyclically, uh, which means that you write some logic, it runs, and then it runs again and again and again, the same code over and over for theoretically infinity. And you define the time at which that code has to execute within using the scan time or cycle time. Some PLCs restrict you to a single scan time, whereas others are more configurable and you can have multiples uh, running at the same time. But this is where the determinism or real time functionality comes in. So what a, what a scan time or cycle time does is it guarantees that the code that you've written will execute within the scan or cycle every time within usually some tolerance uh, that's added onto the end. Now the scan time or cycle time is also uh, tightly linked to the IO. So any IO, the inputs and outputs that you have on your PLC are going to be updating at some time that is related to the scan time or cycle time. And if you're not familiar, modern PLCs are typically running in the millisecond range. So you may have your uh, you know, most important class running at 10 milliseconds or something like that, and then less important things in the 100 millisecond, 500 millisecond uh, type of range. Uh, but for really important uh, applications that require a faster cycle time, you can get down into the microsecond, like 100 microsecond range. Uh, and then there's even some technology out there that lets you get into the single microsecond range. Uh, and we can talk about that in detail in another episode. But you're typically going to see something in the microsecond to millisecond range, depending on the application, depending on the PLC, uh, and depending on how it's been programmed. All right, so we got a little bit into the weeds there uh, on the technical side, so we'll kind of uh, work our way back out of that, and we'll just kind of look at a high-level overview of the kinds of applications that PLCs are used for and some of the functionalities uh, that PLCs have. So I've broken this up into like four or five different categories that we'll jump into in a little bit of detail. So the first category is basic control. 
so to me, basic control means anything uh, that is using timers, handling inputs and outputs, using arithmetic functions, counting, uh, you know, even uh, simple tasks like user role management or recipe management, uh, even things using a little bit more advanced control like PID loop, uh, alarms and alarm handling. So those kind of activities are what I would call basic control. And then from there, we can branch into, uh, you know, what I would call three other core functionalities, uh, motion control, communications, and visualization. And then we've got one kind of special one that we'll talk about at the end. So motion control is going to be things like path planning for robotics and CNC applications, coordinating motion in a servo application, uh, you know, homing the drives, uh, jogging the drives, things like that. Uh, or for example, directly controlling stepper motors. So anything that has to do with a motor or motion of some sort uh, could be handled in, in that kind of application. Communication is going to be the implementation of libraries or some sort of integrated communication interface like RS-232, which is a serial communication protocol, RS-45, Ethernet IP, which you'll find on all of the Allen Bradley products, Ethernet PowerLink, which you'll find on BNR uh, and others because it's open source, Ethercat, again, another open source one. So you'll find it uh, on Beckoff uh, products as well as others in the market, Modbus TCP, Modbus RTU, uh, then even more kind of non-automation standards like HTTP, MQTT, AMQP, OPC UA, and then hopefully in the near future, you'll start hearing a lot more about OPC UA TSN. And honestly, that was just a list of a bunch of different communication protocols, but what you would use that for uh, is communicating to either other machines, to uh, sensors or actuators that run on some sort of field bus or other communication protocol, or even communicating up into the cloud, which is what you would use that MQTT, AMQP, and OPC UA for. So the PLC can typically sit at either end of the communication there. So whether it be a client or server, master or slave, uh, so on and so forth, there's there's a ton of different types of communication, uh, but the PLC can usually be either one. So the last one that we talked about out of the uh, three additional uh, functionality groups is visualization. So visualization is a really, really important part of a machine uh, and it's getting more and more attention these days. So kind of the uh, typical visualization is going to be some sort of proprietary native visualization um, that, that doesn't look very good, honestly, in most cases. Um, but what we're seeing more and more of is moving to a web-based visualization. And in, th in that scenario, typically, uh, if it's an integrated system, you'll see the PLC actually host the web server. Now, the PLC has a lot of other functions. These are just some of the simple ones. Uh, one of those kind of special functions is safety. So a PLC could either be the actual safety PLC that's actually performing machine safety functions, making sure that machine safety functions are adhered to, uh, or it could just be a standard PLC interfacing with some sort of safety system to monitor the status or communicate some sort of data back and forth. All right, so that's as much technical detail as I want to get to in this episode. There's a ton more that we could talk about about the PLC and the different functions that kind of live inside of them. But for now, I want to move to talking about the future. So what does the future of the PLC look like? And what does automation look like for the next generation of machines? And is the PLC a part of that? While I would love to start talking about that right now, I think we deserve a quick break because we've been into the technical weeds for quite some time now. So we will jump into that right after this short break. Alrighty, so what is the future of the PLC? Well, I think first and foremost, from what I've seen, there's really not an indication that much is gonna change as far as the role of the PLC in the future of machines. The reason for that is that the modular design and flexibility of the PLC has made it the preferred technology for automation for the past 50 plus years, and all signs point to a continuation of that trend. As the PLC develops to adapt to the future of automation, I think we're gonna see some things like they're gonna get smaller, they're gonna get faster, they're gonna get cheaper, they'll be more featured and more efficient, uh, 
To remain relevant though in the automation space, PLCs aren't just going to have to get faster, smaller, cheaper, more featured, more efficient. They're going to have to adapt to and integrate trends in the market like Industry 4.0, IIoT, open communications, remote access, and others. I think that we're also going to see some of the consumer electronics features and functions uh, and expectations, honestly, start to trickle into automation. And I think we're already seeing that with some of the web-based visualizations and other features that are starting to show up in machines and some of the higher-end machines in the market. So again, we may see the PLC change to be smaller, to be faster, to be lighter, uh, to be in the cloud. Who knows what's going to happen? But we can say with some level of confidence that the core ideas and the core principles behind the PLC that make it what it is that were conceived some 50 plus years ago are going to stay the same. And in my opinion, that's a really good thing. It means that the machines that we're building today are built on a really robust and a really stable and a really well thought out platform. The PLC is a really strong piece of technology that has served the automation industry well for 50 plus years. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Well, to those of you that stuck around to the end, I think we learned quite a lot today. We learned how a New Year's Day hangover was related to the birth of the PLC. We learned a little bit about some other history of the PLC. We learned what a PLC is, some of the core functionalities and applications. And then we also talked kind of briefly about what the future of the PLC is and what the future holds for automation. I hope you found some little nuggets in this episode that were interesting to you or maybe something that you didn't know before. In future episodes, we're going to be taking a look at some really exciting new technologies that are coming out uh, like cybersecurity and IIoT, machine learning and AI. We'll be taking a look at some long stator linear motor track technology, machine vision, lots of really, really exciting topics lined up. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite player platform, whether that's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. If you'd like to get in contact with me, or if you have any suggestions for topics, please send an email to automationpodcast at gmail.com, and I'll be sure to get back to you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of This Is Automation, and I'll catch you next time.